Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is our last big webinar of the year, so we're super excited to have you here. Today we're going to be talking about using your roadmap to shape your product culture. Uh, I am Andrea, I'm the Customer Experience Manager here at ProdPad, uh, and with me is Jana Basto, our CEO. Uh, so we're going to get started really, really shortly, like in about 20 seconds, so make sure that you have your teas or waters uh, and sit back comfortably. Uh, just some quick housekeeping. Uh, yes, this is being recorded. So if you do have to pop out to the bathroom, that is OK. We will send you the recording after. And we're also going to be taking questions at the end. Uh, so make sure that you have those ready to go. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Jana. OK, wonderful. Thanks for the, the warm intro, Andrea. And hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, so as Andrea said, we're going to be talking about how to shape your product culture using your roadmap. And I hope these are some tips or some things that are going to get you thinking about how you're going to apply these uh, for the new year. Um, so before we get started, let's talk about what a product culture is. Um, or conversely, let's talk about what it isn't. Because uh, as you can imagine, I'm not talking about adding foosball tables and beer fridges to your offices. Uh, what I'm actually talking about is the, the culture of, the, of your company itself and the people in your company. And I like to think about it as the culture is defined by the decisions that your team makes, even in your absence, even without given explicit instructions. And culture is hugely important because it shapes the potential that your company has in the long run. And to be honest, I think that there's actually a, a big shift in how companies are going to operate uh, because companies have changed over the history. Uh, and I think that having a good product culture is going to be the next step that will, in the long run, save your company from doom. And by doom, I don't mean all doom and relevance and insolvency and not becoming the next dinosaur. Uh, so just a quick recap of um, how work has evolved over time. I mean, you know, early, early days, uh, we, we would, it was each person for their own. Each person would find their own food and create their own tools and do whatever that was needed to survive. But over time, we learned to specialize into specific areas, uh, like one person being the, uh, the person who would uh, do the hunting and somebody else who would do the farming and somebody else who would do the, the metalworking. And they would learn to trade um, these, these goods. They would specialize in a particular area. And that was actually really key because that opened up uh, for uh, changes much further down the line where you got into manufacturing, where each person, each worker on the line was in charge of one particular piece. And this created a very much of a command and control type of way of working. And it was efficient because you would have one person, one boss at the top who would see, oversee the entire operations and would uh, find out where those inefficiencies are and fix the different areas of that manufacturing line that, uh, uh, that, that happened along the way. Now, of course, this is a vast oversimplification, but it does lead us into what happened when we became less about the industrial age manufacturer worker, uh, much more of the knowledge worker sitting at your desk coming up with creative work. And that is surely what most of us here do. Uh, and even though the type of work that we're doing has evolved, the command and control way of working hasn't really evolved. Uh, we're starting to see changes in that, but how we work today isn't vastly different from how people were working 70 years ago. Um, and the model is now starting to look outdated. Uh, so let's look at um, some reasons why. Um, and I think what's happening is that companies are getting stuck with these really unhealthy incentives. Um, and what's really happening is that the companies are, at the end of the day, responsible for the shareholder value. The CEO has a fiduciary duty to increase shareholder value, and the CEOs are incentivized to show quarter on quarter growth. And this isn't year on year growth. This isn't um, you know decade on decade growth. This is usually quarter on quarter. Uh, and if they don't show this quarter on quarter growth, they know what's happening. They're getting turfed. They don't get their Christmas bonus. They don't make, they don't get to sit around long enough to see what happens uh, several years down the line. And you've see how, seen how often CEOs tend to get flipped in public companies. And so the management itself, the management style itself tends to lend itself to uh, slow improvements, driving either driving costs down or revenues up, but rarely given the opportunity to invest in this proper future growth. And so 
what you see is these incre incremental improvements happening, uh, which is great. It looks like you've got uh, upward trending growth, but on the whole, they're actually missing a big piece because this is what you're actually seeing in that these companies are uh, hitting their local maximum, but not necessarily hitting their global maximum. Uh, the best way I can, uh, I've heard of exploding this local maximum versus uh, true maximum or global maximum is imagine you were airdropped into a hilly terrain and all you had in front of you, it was nighttime, you had a, uh, a lamp and you could only see a few feet in front of you and you were told that your objective was to get to the top of the hill. Now, if you can only see a few feet around you, you can't actually, you know, your, your only tactic would be to go uphill uh, and you'd be able to sense that based on how you're walking and uh, looking at the ground right around you. But you wouldn't be able to see if there was a bigger hill across the way. You would never actually truly know if you were at the local maximum or at the true maximum. And that's what's happening is that you've got this myopic, myopic view of the work that's being done and you're incrementing upwards, but you're hitting a, a at best a local maximum and you're never actually looking at the wider value or the wider problems to be solved. And so the reality is, is that there might be much more value elsewhere uh, that you're not achieving through these short-term optimizations. And in order to make that jump, it requires risk and investment. But it's rarely seen as a problem because the numbers are creeping up and each division is striving towards their targets. And what they tend to do is they don't look at the entire company. When you're running a, a, a massive company like this, uh, the, the command and control way of working is to still separate out the workers, the, 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 the organization into these different groups. And you'll have uh, cost centers and profit centers. Like for example, a sales team is a classic profit center. And so you'd be looking at tweaking out, uh, tweaking the um, commission plans or the pricing structures or other things to tweak out extra little bits of profit, incrementally improving that. And other areas are considered a cost center. And these are areas where you want to bring your costs down. They're, they serve, uh, the, the, the reason they exist is to serve the operations of the business. And the reality is product, customer service, innovation, R&D, they are usually considered cost centers in these businesses. And so the CEO's main driver, the shareholder's main interest is to drive the cost down, but not necessarily make any major changes to it. And so by driving these numbers, uh, the, the profits up, the revenues up and the cost down, you can get that incremental quarter on quarter growth. But it does mean that you sometimes end up with a in a dangerous territory called vanity metrics, where you've got you know, sales saying, oh, well, we've closed this many deals and marketing saying they've got this many leads and product saying how many features they got out the door and, and that sort of thing. But the reality is, is that they're not necessarily playing together to create a more holistic way of working. They're not necessarily looking at solving a bigger problem as an organization, definitely not using all of their potential. Uh, and it leads to siloed decisions, which make sense for the bottom line, but seem really counterintuitive, especially to us sitting on the outside, looking at the company's uh, performance as a whole. Um, you know, here we've got this guy who's really pleased to uh, to say that he's brought the cost down, uh, but complaints have driven up. Um, but to be honest, this isn't his problem. This is probably a different group's problem. And so this is what happens when you start uh, separating out these different groups using this old school style of management and applying it to companies today. And here's the other reality. When you hit any sort of maximum, when you hit the top of that graph, you may have been able to innovate your way and you know iterate your way up to the top but once you're at the very top, you tend to start really plateauing. And this is the reality for so many companies out there that we think are the absolute giants. They are just not growing. I mean, they are seeing growth, not in tens of percentages, but in fractions of percentages. Uh, so large corporations are struggling to grow because they've basically plateaued. They're at their the top of their, their maxima. Now, as to whether that is a local maxima or whether that's the true entire value that they could ever see, um, I would bet that chances are they're stuck in a local maxima and they need to make that leap. Um, and in order to make that leap, you need to test in areas of operations outside of your comfort zone. And this experimentation can be costly uh, for so many reasons, and it can be really awkward and uncomfortable for everyone in the organization if anybody's have to, had to go through any sort of change management. 
Uh, and this is particularly awkward for an organization with poor product culture. Um, companies who are used to delivering results in their silos, but aren't incentivized or don't feel safe enough to test the boundaries. Um, even if it does save the company in the long run, they're looking to get their, their paychecks and their bonuses for the next quarter. And this is actually something that some that somebody said to me uh, at a, a presentation I did, and this is uh, from somebody who worked at a bank. And this bank was uh, somewhere between 150 and 200 years old. Uh, they had obviously survived through generations of work. They barely survived the 2008 downturn. They were one of the many who were bailed out by the governments. And he said to me, every company that ever has does or will exist, will one day go bust. It's just a matter of when. And that sounds nihilistic, but it's also quite realistic. Um, we know that at the end of the day, the best thing we can do is extend the life of our product lines, of our, of our businesses, um, to create the most value for the longest amount of time. So even when you've got companies who are 150 years old, um, there's still people who are realizing that um, you know, there, there may come an end. There may be time that they don't get bailed out. Um, and this is even with the most secure, largest companies. And we've seen this change. Um, this is actually probably outdated now as well, but this is looking back at the largest US companies today versus the ones in 2008, um, so 10 years ago. And you can see that even in this space, there's been a massive amount of churn in this top 10 rankings. Um, so even for these large companies, their place at the top, even with all the resources, is not necessarily locked in place. So, how can a good product culture help save your company from doom? Well, let's look at some of the elements of a good company culture. Uh, one of the most important elements of it is having a clear direction, having alignment of the team, having everyone understand what problem that exists out there that they're looking to solve, understanding what the mission of the company is. So this alignment is hugely important and works hand in hand with autonomy, as in giving people in the team the ability to put their best efforts to use, put their resources to use to solve these problems. Uh, this graph actually sums up um, a nice way of looking at that. So this is our, uh, I hope you guys recognize the pointy haired boss from uh, Dilbert. He's telling the team what to do. And you've got teams who have um, uh, high alignment, as in they all understand what it is they're going. They've got this North Star they're all aiming for. And you've got low alignment. And you've also got low autonomy versus high autonomy, as in in the um, uh, low autonomy, they're being told what to do, whereas in the high autonomy, uh, the people in the organization have the choices, uh, get to make the choices as to how they tackle that. Uh, and ideally, you always want to be in this top quadru quadrant, uh, you have teams that have high alignment and high autonomy. The reality is that most of these companies are operating in this high alignment and low autonomy, as in they're being told what to do and moving forwards, uh, moving forwards towards that, but aren't necessarily collaborating, aren't necessarily working together to find the best solutions, aren't necessarily even asking questions about whether there are other North Stars they should be go going to aim for. Um, and it's just as bad over in this quadrant where you've got teams with low alignment but high autonomy. Um, you see a lot of young companies operating this way where they don't necessarily have that, that direction as to where they're heading. And so they end up putting in their best efforts and not actually necessarily solving any real problems. So you need to get that high alignment, that, that clear direction, as well as the autonomy to really succeed. But that itself won't do because I see psychological safety as a multiplier on this. And psychological safety is, uh, you can see it in the way that people feel, uh, whether they feel comfortable speaking up and reporting errors, or whether they feel comfortable making uh, bets or um, uh, running experiments, whether they feel comfortable making suggestions or admitting that they were wrong on something or calling out a colleague in a constructive way on something. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about how to build psychological safety and how it plays it out in your team and in your roadmap. But this is actually part of this can actually just be instilled by changes in your language. A couple examples in there is, you know, it helps to remember that you 
in your space, in the organization, whether you are um, the exec who is meant to be given giving that alignment or whether you're a product manager uh, somewhere in the in the throes of the company or wherever you are it helps to remember that you know nothing or actually you don't know everything it's never your job to have all the answers you're supposed to know less than your colleagues collectively and instead the best thing you can be doing particularly as a product person right in the middle there is to be focusing on asking the best questions and to making making sure that you're creating a safe space for everyone to contribute, to, to ask their own questions. Uh, I like to phrase questions so that they begin with, how might we? Uh, what it does, it turns the issue into collective problem. It supposes instead of asserts. And it works really well in conjunction with my other favorite phrase, I bet. Because as a product manager, you're gonna be wrong a lot. I bet gives you permission to fail and to try again. After all, it wasn't you that was wrong, it was your hypothesis. And now that you know it doesn't work, you're feel, you can feel free to test the next bet. So it's subtle, but these shifts in language help set the stage for psychological safety. And so, as I said, these are the elements of a good uh, product culture, having clear direction and autonomy, but adding that psychological safety as a multiplier that can really make your team much more powerful than any other. So how does the roadmap help with all of this? Um, well, the roadmap is actually probably telling you more than you think. Um, so let's take a look at what a roadmap is. Um, I like to think about it as a strategic communication doc. It's how the product manager, how the product team articulates their understanding of the strategy. Um, now, I do a bunch of uh, what I call roadmap clinics, and a roadmap clinic is a one-hour session where we'll sit down, we'll look at your roadmap, and uh, we'll, we'll help the product manager articulate this strategy, uh, articulate the team's needs using this roadmap. Um, so that's to say that I see a lot of roadmaps, and one thing I've noticed is that the roadmap can actually be a diagnostic tool for the state of a company. As a matter of fact, a bad roadmap is a clear symptom of underlying issues in the company. And I've got some examples of where I've seen different types of roadmaps or different um, uh, problems on roadmaps and what the, the diagnosis is or where that might be affecting their product culture. So an example, having initiatives on your roadmap written as uh, discrete features or solutions instead of outlining problems to be solved. Uh, if you have a roadmap that is uh, more about the features, much more than the actual problems, that often shows that you've got a lack of autonomy in the company. People don't have that space to go uh, find their, their own way to solve those problems. Uh, if you've got, um, I've seen some companies who just moved away from having roadmaps altogether or having a vision um, where they're, you know, they've got nothing tied back to the company level objectives. This is that bottom uh, quadrant where you had um, high autonomy but low alignment uh, diagnosis. This is a lack of clear direction. And I also see this often enough where the roadmap is dictated from above. It's a wish list of the execs. There's no room for questions or crucially for experiments or, uh, or validation. And this is often a uh, signal of lacking psychological safety across the team. And you know what the biggest offender that I see is? The timeline roadmap. Now, I know this format of a roadmap makes you look good today. Your board and your bosses certainly love when you can give them this level of certainty, but it's setting you up for failure. See, if you deconstruct this format of the roadmap, you basically get a chart that maps out time versus things to do. You have time here on the x-axis that creates this timeline. And at first, it seems pretty easy and intuitive to use, especially in the short term, but the further out you plan and the more you put on there, the harder it becomes to manage. And because that timeline sits at the top, always marching forwards, no matter what you put on the roadmap, they always include a due date and a time estimate just by the very format of this roadmap. And as a result, you end up with a big pile of features and a big pile of deadlines, and it's all based on this big pile of assumptions. And the first assumption you've made with this format is that you know how long each of these is going to take. Now, this might be easy for the stuff you've already broken down into more detail and had the developers give some estimates, but the further down the list you go, the less clarity you've actually got on how long each thing's going to take. 
And you're also assuming that nothing else is going to come in and mess up your timeline. No changes in the market, no new competitors, no fresh ideas coming from your customers, no need for iteration. And you're also assuming that each of these features is going to work as soon as they launch. So let's say you put three weeks in to build that new checkout page. Then at the end of three weeks, it should be converting exactly as expected, and you're free to move on to the next thing. And by explicitly adding these features to the timeline, you're assuming that each of these features actually definitely deserves to exist, that they form part of the strategy and therefore should be codified. And at the end of the day, you're making one big dangerous assumption, which is that nothing is going to change. And so what could possibly go wrong? Well, you've got these made up release dates, which are forcing your developers on these stressful marches to launch on time. Your sales and your customers are getting expectations that you can't meet. And you're often missing opportunities in the market and sometimes even downright building the wrong things. And this leads to you being a sad product manager. And there's also a vicious cycle in there because what tends to happen is that uh, if you create this uh, version of a timeline roadmap and you ask your developers to outline how long each thing is going to take, you end up with people giving you bigger and bigger buffers to make sure that they never miss that deadline. Because if they miss that deadline, then it means they're late for the next thing. Uh, and everyone knows that time expands to fill the time uh, that, that work expands to fill the, the time given to it. And so it actually quite literally slows down work. It means that you end up taking longer to do the same amount of work than if given no timelines on it. Uh, and so the longer estimations create these longer, riskier looking timelines, and execs are even less comfortable giving freedom to build in lean ways, as in testing and failing and, uh, and learning along the way. So they actually try to tie down uh, even more tight deadlines, so they feel they have better control on costs. Again, because this is because um, product and development and innovation are all a cost center. They want to drive those costs down uh, quarter on quarter. And that results in this blame culture where people are coming up with deadlines and asking why you haven't hit them and uh, people creating even bigger buffers to protect themselves from that. And blame culture is basically the opposite of having psychological safety within your team. But the problem is it's a trap because it looks as if it's working. The costs are being driven down. Everyone is delivering everything by their deadlines, or at least some of the stuff by their deadlines. And month on month, quarter on quarter, the, the profits are growing and the CEO is getting their bonus. But in the long run, these companies are doomed because they're optimizing for short-term consistent growth, but they're leaving behind the option to be, to be flexible and to solve new problems in the future. The industry is catching up and will surpass them. Uh, smarter, st smaller startups are always going to be nipping at their heels and able to operate faster. Uh, and so we'll look at some examples of that later on as well. So is there a better way? Well, of course there is. I implore you all to do this with me, which is ditch your timeline roadmap. I'm going to give you some steps to build a better product culture by changing your roadmap. So step one, start with your product vision. Make sure that you and your team have a product vision that's been written down and everyone agrees on and everyone understands. This is a format that I like using. Uh, you might recognize it from Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm book. It was originally set up as an elevator pitch template, but it also works really well for a product vision because it asks the right questions. Who are you building for and what's going to set you apart? Uh, and so in that formula of uh, creating a good culture, this is where the product vision helps. It helps create that clear direction that you need. Uh, step two, map out your objectives. And these should be outcome-based goals that are tied to your company strategies. You might know these as KPIs or OKRs, or like us, you might just simply call them objectives. It doesn't matter what you call them. It's just whatever works for you and your team. The point is that they act as guardrails to keep everyone pointing in the right direction and working on solving the right sorts of problems. The important thing is, is to focus on outcome over output. An example is measuring output is like counting how many story points have been completed, whereas measuring outcomes means that you're tying results back to the original company level goals. Uh, and change out your 
timeline for time horizons. So instead of that format of roadmap that's basically a chart with time on the x-axis, uh, think in terms of these three buckets. So you've got your first bucket, your, your, your now, your current term, where you're really granular about your focus and your scope. This is the stuff that's being prototyped, tested, and built right now. You've got a lot of visibility into what's happening here. Whereas you move into the next and into the later, it's much more about, um, it's much less about specific in initiatives, but more about outlining the problems that you think need to be solved in order to fulfill your vision. These are assumptions to be validated. And so this is where the objectives and the time horizons come in. They set the uh, guardrails for your team and give them time horizons so that they can work on things in a, uh, a, a timely fashion, but make sure that they're putting the effort into uh, build the right stuff, build the right tests, check that it's working, and solve those problems. This allows them to be much more autonomous than if they've been given a, uh, a project plan that stretches out of the course of a year. And you know what, the larger a company gets, the more experimentation starts to get stifled. Uh, stifled. Uh, you probably all know this build, measure, learn diagram from the, the lean startup movement. Uh, and it seems simple. Uh, it is simple, which is until you've got competition nipping at your heels and a growing base of customers asking for more and more and, and tech debt creeping in at the edges. And what you end up doing is you forget to spend the time on the measure and learn side, you end up shoveling new features out the door, features and fixes and you know, in panic mode, and you end up with the build, build, build cycle, um, which is also known as the build trap. And this is what a build trap roadmap might look like. You end up with a whole pile of features and deadlines and a whole pile of assumptions. But you can get out of this trap. It's really important to build in the time and the space to validate the work that's being done. And it's not that teams don't understand that it's, uh, that it's important to move the right metrics. It's often that they don't have the permission and time to stop building and actually do the measurements. And validation is a really key term here because I think about the roadmap not as this perfect plan, but more as a prototype for your strategy. Your roadmap is for validation. Uh, just as you might validate a feature by drawing up some paper prototypes and showing them to your customers and then starting again based on that feedback, your roadmap is a starting point for conversation around what needs to be included in your strategy. And so put those elements together, your vision, your objectives, your time horizons, your experimentation, and you get a lean roadmap. Uh, and each of these blocks that you see here are initiatives or problems to be solved. Each one are, uh, are linked to specific initiatives. And you can even add in the experimentation that I mentioned as well, where um, each card is then connected to a list of experiments that could be run in order to solve that problem and impact that objective. Uh, and so this is how you can use your roadmap to give you an overview of progress on ongoing experiments. Uh, and other key thing is once a project is done in development, don't just throw out these results or tuck them away somewhere where you'll never find them. I see a bad habit all the time where you've released something, so you close all the tickets in JIRA, you crumple up the sticky notes on the wall, and you start moving on to the next thing, which seems good for keeping up cadence, but really bad for ensuring that you're actually making an impact as an organization. After all, just because something was launched doesn't mean that it actually solved the problem you wanted it to. And so what you can do is move those cards into a list of uh, completed uh, cards, move, the, move those experiments over into a list of completed cards, uh, some sort of a validation roadmap, if you will. Uh, and the purpose of this is to give you a space to track what was released and when, and then outline the results. Uh, did it solve the problem and move the metric you were hoping it would? Or do you need to go back and run some more experiments or try some new things to, to make sure you're properly solving that problem? So by building this validation into your roadmap, you create a space to show the value of the work done. And so this experimentation and validation, this is your multiplier. This is how you can build in that psychological safety, that space and time for validation that's really key to psychological safety, which is key to creating a good product culture. And the value of this roadmap format is that it takes the focus off building features and hitting delivery dates and helps your team strive towards solving actual problems. Now, I can hear you all saying, what if I have to give delivery dates? <laughs> 
Um, because dates can be on a roadmap. Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes there are milestones and dates that have to be communicated. Some examples just from this year, um, you know, who here had to build something for GDPR? Everyone in Europe and I mean, most companies around the world had to touch something. So GDPR or other compliance or legal milestones, uh, or perhaps you are a seasonal company. You need to get ready so, so, something ready in time for the new school year or Christmas, for example. The key thing is, is that these are strategically important initiatives and they have to be communicated against a date. And the roadmap is a strategic communication tool. And so if part of the strategy is to remain legal by a specific date or get your product out by a specific date, then so be it. Um, the roadmap can be used to communicate dates in these cases and other cases. The ongoing problem we have is that people put timelines at the top of the roadmap and then map out the items underneath it. And what that's doing is assuming a date for everything on the roadmap, when in reality, what you want to be doing is just focusing on the stuff that actually has to have a milestone set against it. Um, so what people are doing is creating this date driven roadmap, uh, giving the impression that you're promising all of the features on the roadmap by their associated dates. Now, in reality, most companies have some, but not all initiatives that have unchangeable due dates. And the important thing is, is that these are externally driven and strategically important. So some good examples, as I said, GDPR um, or some sort of legal compliance due date or Christmas or school year. They're strategically important and externally driven, and you can include individual dates on the, the initiatives on the roadmap cards without necessarily putting a date along the top and promising a date for everything in that row. Uh, bad reasons to have dates. Um, <laughs> a lot of people have dates on the roadmap because they assume their bosses expect it. Um, but the reality is, is that you can actually paint a pretty clear picture of the strategic steps you think are necessary if you back it up with research and give it a strong reasoning for the priority without actually putting the delivery dates on something. Um, as long as you're making sure, as long as you're showing that you can, uh, you're sh as long as you're showing that you are doing what's best for the business and that you're not wasting resources uh, and ensuring that you're solving actual problems for the company, um, then this usually works. Um, after all, they don't know how big the team's going to be by the end of next year, let alone, uh, you know, how much funding you're going to have or how quickly everyone's going to be able to deliver. So oftentimes your bosses don't expect it, not for everything. And they just want to see the key milestones that are strategically important to stick to. Um, and as I showed, the very format of the roadmap can lead people to implying dates on the roadmap. Um, just because one roadmap initiative has a date doesn't mean the entire roadmap needs to be tainted by this. Um, instead, you can annotate the important dates and milestones right on the roadmap cards themselves. You still get to ditch that timeline roadmap. And I see this one, it's a bad habit because people assume that if they outline a list of dates on a roadmap and give it to their team, it's going to focus the team's attention and make them work faster, which is sometimes true. Sometimes they will get things out the door a little bit faster, but the reality is, is that you're always going to end up with rushed work, um, moving on to the next project before you've actually completed the experiments from the first one. Uh, you'll accumulate tech debt. And even though it looks like you're moving faster, in reality, you're probably not solving the bigger problems any faster. It might look good to the shareholders who are seeing month on month growth, quarter on quarter growth, but it's not gonna look particularly good when you know, you've got a developer who starts um, and notices all the tech debt, or you've got this list of features that you don't know why they exist besides the fact that you wanted to put features on a roadmap. So bad reasons are uh, around if you think your bosses expect it, if the roadmap format implies it, or if you think it's going to focus the team and speed them up. So before you put a date on a roadmap, just ask yourself, what's driving this need for a date? Is it internal or external? What are we willing to sacrifice for this? Are you willing to reprioritize stuff if something slips and you need to make room so that you can get this thing out by Christmas? Is it strategically important? And have a think about what kind of organization you want to operate as. Uh, few companies are on either end of the scale. You know, on one far side, you've got the super nimble and lean uh, companies. And on the other side, you've got these super slow risk averse companies. And the further, are, further on you are to the slow and risk averse, the more likely you do have dates and other commitments to work towards. Um, now, 
there's actually another type of company that operate entirely based on dates. Uh, and let's be honest, a lot of companies make their money by selling their time on projects. And there's no shame in this. That's one good way of making money. Um, they're called agencies. You do a project, you sell your team's time for it, you have a deliverable, you get paid for it. And these are companies who are good at creating that amount of buffer and pricing it in. And if they get really good at that, you can run a business that way. Reality is though, agencies don't change the world. They sell their time. And at the end of the day, the companies that change the world are the ones that sell on value. Product companies are the companies that change the world. And again, let's look at how companies have been changing. And you notice something about the companies who are the new entrants in here. You know, gone are the days of the oil barons, and we're now looking at tech companies dominating this. And why is that? It's because they're actually using tech in strategically interesting ways, including changing models and uh, creating paradigm shifts in very different uh, ways. I mean, you've got Uber, who is a taxi company, a transportation company, but they don't really own vehicles. Um, you've got um, Alibaba, a huge retailer that has no inventory. Uh, Netflix is a television network, doesn't have cables. Uh, and so these are companies who are changing the way that people work, not by starting off as a television network and then iterating to get better and better at that. They leapfrogged, they jumped to a completely different hill uh, and stepped outside of what their competitors' local maxima was and found their own uh, massive um, uh, pot of gold, uh, their own massive hill to climb up. And so you see tech companies take this. And this is a huge opportunity for us, uh, folks like us who are product managers building tech. Uh, are there ways that we can be looking outside of what our company does today and leapfrog our competition by building new value elsewhere? And the reality is, is that if you are one of those big companies, a cable company or an oil company or a car company, and you're being disrupted, uh, or even if you're not being disrupted, you are about to be. Because any company that has nice quarter on quarter growth, has any share of the market, has any profit, has any PR, is going to have lots and lots of companies nipping at their heels. And so... You know, you can see how some companies start off on one end of this scale um, and uh, they become more slow and risk averse at over time. And to be honest, on the slow and risk averse side of this, it's actually good money. I mean, it's at this point where most of the money is made. Um, but reality is, is that the further along you go, uh, the more you are likely to have companies nipping at your heels. Uh, this is a screenshot of the HSBC uh, homepage. And this is just an example of all the different companies, little startups, some of which you might have heard of, some of which you haven't heard of, all taking a bite out of the interesting pieces of their business model. Uh, and HSBC as a company is going to have to try to hold it together or somehow fend them off. They're fighting a battle on many fronts. So even though they've got this huge pile of money and uh, government backing to stay alive, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be there forever you could see companies like this easily getting replaced over time. So the best companies are the ones who are able to take that growth that they've had, but then splinter off some other resources to focus on growing their business. So here's a few tactics. Um, I call this one the Google. Uh, Google was famous for their 20% time. Uh, they gave their staff the equivalent of one day per week to work on whatever it was they want whatever it was they wanted to. Uh, now, it might seem like a huge waste of resources, but some of their core products like Gmail and Maps came out of this initiative. Uh, now, 20% might be a lot for most companies, uh, but perhaps you can carve out just 2% or 0.2% and see what comes out of it. Uh, the hackathon. This is one of my favorites because it's just as good for building disruptive products as it is for team building. Uh, give your team a time box week of freedom to put together a simple product and it could very well be the start of a new profitable business line. Uh, the lab is an approach used by a lot of larger enterprises, uh, usually those going through some sort of 
digital transformation. Um, the, the lab is a small division inside a large corporation that looks and acts like a startup, uh, but has the backing of their corporate parent. So if the prototype or whatever it is that this, this lab creates gets any interest, it can instantly be funded and grow into something much more powerful than what a standalone startup might be able to pull off themselves. And finally, the Facebook. Uh, Facebook has one of the largest user bases in the world, but they never ever release something to everyone at the same time. In fact, they've mastered the art of segmenting their users into tiny groups to test and release new features just one group at a time. And this reduces the risk of trying out these new things, but still gives them the freedom to learn and to find those bigger hills elsewhere. So it removes the risk of launching and allows them to experiment way more readily as a result. And so these are some tactics that you can use in your company to um, help disrupt your own product before somebody else comes along or before it starts entering the decline stage. Your goal is to breathe new life into your maturing product by adding more value or expanding your market. And if done right, you can extend your product's life and expand your revenues even further. So let's tie this back because you could study Facebook down to the finest detail, but you wouldn't be able to build it yourself by using the same steps that Zuckerberg did. Did. Instead, you're going to have to look deeper into the company because these are tactics that work today for some companies. Um, look beyond their strategy, look beyond their vision, look at the culture of the types of companies who are dominating the charts today. The product culture is about how your team interacts with the product and with you, how they ask questions, how they feel about uh, failure and admitting failure, how they feel about experimenting and looking for the next big hill. And these aren't things that happen overnight. A good product culture evolves. And I like to think about product culture as a, as a product itself, something that can be cultivated, iterated, measured and improved upon. I'd say that product culture is the most important product that you'll ever work on. And so with that, I want to make an offer to you guys. Uh, if anybody here is interested in having a chat about your product culture, about your roadmap, um, we can have a one-on-one -on -one chat. Uh, you can book a roadmap clinic with myself or somebody else on our team following this link here. We will send this out uh, afterwards as well, so don't feel bad if you don't grab this. Uh, but join us for a roadmap clinic. And in the meantime, I think we have some time for uh, questions. Thanks very much. I was going to say, yes, we do. And I have what I expected to absolutely be a question. So I'm glad that somebody asked it. Um, Steve and uh, Zeno want to know, uh, what are your thoughts on the use case for a date-driven roadmap when sales needs to know when to promise delivery to customers based on contractual agreements? Uh, the old uh, sales argument. Uh, to be honest, I would argue that sales doesn't need a date-driven roadmap. Um, you should be able to trust your, your sales team to understand what the bigger problems are that you're looking to solve. Uh, you should be able to share with them the prototypes and the things you're working on, but you should also be able to be honest about the product delivery process and what kind of things go into it. In reality, if these people are any good, they should be focusing on selling what you have today. If they are not able to do so, either they're not very good salespeople or your product isn't ready for a sales team. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go fire all your salespeople. If you don't have a product that is actually ready for sales and there's nothing for them to sell today, redeploy the salespeople as research agents. They should be going out and talking to companies on your behalf and saying, what kind of problems do you have? What kind of things could we build? And as long as they learn to um, not uh, make promises on what's going to be built, just like you as a product manager would know to do, you wouldn't go out there and promise exactly what's going to be built. Your sales people can come back with the same sorts of insights and can be really helpful for you, uh, but doesn't necessarily mean that they need to know all those, um, uh, the, a date-driven roadmap to do their job. They should be selling what you have today and advocating for the problems that you could be solving down the line. Now, there is a difference there because, you know, let's say you've got a release coming out next week. Well, 
in reality, by the time it comes to next week, you've probably got a release plan going about what kind of things are coming out. And with the release plan, you've got a high level of certainty. Um, sometimes releases slip, but usually not more than a few days or a few weeks at most, whereas a roadmap might change massively over the course of the year. And that's a key thing, is that a roadmap is a different document than your release plan. A roadmap is a, is a strategic communication tool outlining the problems to be solved along the way to, to meet your product vision, whereas your release plan is the list of all the work that's being done um, and who's working on what and what kind of dependencies are on each other to get something out for next Tuesday's release. Um, if you feel safe, you can tell your product, you can, sorry, you can tell your salespeople that something's likely to come out on, on Tuesday. Uh, but even then, I wouldn't recommend making hard promises on that because, as you know, delivery dates slip, releases go wrong. Um, and so you can kind of give them a, a release plan with a caveat at that point in time. I hope that helps answer the question. Uh, yeah, we just had uh, another one uh, popping up. Um, can you show me or direct me to guidance on how to implement this strategy in the roadmap part of the tool? Yes, we can do that for you, Nora. Uh, this alignment with a product team vision, however, the roadmap tool seems overly simple. Uh, there isn't a way to indicate impact versus effort on the cards. Uh, actually, there is. <laughs> uh, I don't. Has that been released yet? I actually don't know. <laughs> that's it. That that's it. That's it. That is terrible on my part. If it hasn't been released, it, hasn't been released. it is absolutely coming. I think Jana wants to say something right now. Uh, really good question, and it sounds like we're talking to somebody who's already a prod patter, so you're familiar with the tool. Uh, there are actually ways of showing impact and effort of at the card level, uh, so we can show you through some ways of doing that. And actually, based on feedback from folks like yourselves, we have, I guess you can say, paved the, the, the cow path, uh, and we're actually releasing a sort of fixed feature in that. Um, now, you, you know me, I can't give you any promises on exactly what's going to be delivered and when, but I can tell you that we're doing some active prototypes on that. Um, if anybody here would like, you can try ProdPad and see the roadmap as it is today, but also reach out to us. We have an active beta program where you can see and get involved in the tests of the different things that we're adding to the roadmap uh, going forwards, and you can actually help input what this impact effort looks like or what all the other features are going to look like as we build out this roadmap. Um, so definitely get in touch about that. I have a really interesting question. Uh, where would be the best material, uh, or if you can talk a little bit about uh, how to transition from Jira waterfall environment to a more agile environment within ProdPad? You can't just land the plane and take off again. Really good question. And that's actually a really tough one for a lot of people is that transition from the old way of working and the new way of working. Uh, there is no one way of doing it. Um, every company is going to be different. It hugely depends on the context of how you guys are using your tools and what it is you're looking to get out of it. Uh, it is something that we can advise upon. We can set up one of these uh, clinics with you and walk through what that process would look like. Um, and uh, as part of that conversation, we could point you to different um, guides or um, uh, next steps that'll help you move from one to the other. Uh, the key thing is it's at the end of the day, it's a change management thing. It's something that you're going to have to um, figure out and test a few different ways that work for you, um, advocate it with people in the team, show them how this new process works uh, and roll it out in um, uh, larger and larger circles around you as you go. Um, just as you can iterate on a product, you can iterate on a product process. Um, you can look at all the different books on how Agile works, and you can follow them to a T, but I guarantee you it won't fit you to a T because your team will be different. Every person has implemented Agile in a slightly different way. Every person has implemented Jira in a slightly different way. Um, we here at ProdPad have seen literally thousands of different variations of this, so feel free to reach out to us and we can give some guidance uh, and chat you through what your specific challenges are and make sure you're on the right path. Well, thanks, Jenna. Uh, we do have another one, uh, and I have uh, just posted a video to our um, YouTube channel, uh, so you can watch that, um, and also the resource uh, for the Roadmap Clinic. But um, how would you suggest um, building or creating a card? Um, someone's having a bit of a tough time understanding how these cards sort of come together. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so it's probably worth pointing out that a card on a roadmap uh, actually represents um, 
uh, different things at different stages within the roadmap. So I talked about those time horizons, the, the, the now, the next, and the later. Um, a card that's in the later column often just represents a problem that you know is on the horizon, an obstacle you're pretty sure you're going to have to overcome, or a strategic step that you think you need to validate before you get there. And at that point in time, it might just be a simple you know, card with a title and a quick description of what it is you think you're going to do. Um, just like when you do a first cut of a feature on a, you know, if you're, if, you, if you're thinking about adding a button to a page, you're not going to get too detailed about getting the super high def version of it. You might just scribble it out on a piece of paper and see how it fits, show it to a cu couple of customers and get the feedback on it before you start working on higher def versions. So the cards in the future tend to be pretty high level and nebulous, and that's okay because they're just there to help you articulate what you think the strategy is so you can test and check that and, and change that roadmap as you go. As that card moves towards the now uh, column, moves through the next column and the now column, it tends to uh, organically change. Sometimes you'll end up seeing that some obstacle that you thought was on the horizon isn't an obstacle. It'll disappear off the horizon. You've changed directions and it's no longer an issue. Um, sometimes you think that an obstacle in the future ends up being much bigger and you end up breaking it into two or three other cards. Uh, and that's pretty normal too. As it gets closer to the now, you'll start adding much more detail to it. So you'll link it to the going to tackle for your team. You'll link it to different experiments that you think you're going to try. You'll outline the scope more and more. You might use it to outline the impact and effort it's going to take as a company. You might outline a, a, an owner on it. There's a bunch of different details you include on it. At the end of the day, um, your roadmap is going to look different than anybody else's and your roadmap format is going to be different than anybody else's. Your roadmap shouldn't try to aspire to look like your roadmap from a different company or from even from your roadmap from a year ago. Your roadmap should change and should adjust as you go. Uh, the roadmap should be a one page document, one to two page document that is human readable to the point that you can take it, show it to a stakeholder in the team, and they should more or less understand where it is you're now, where, where it is that you are now, what kind of problems you're working on, and what kind of problems you see in the future. And they should be able to pitch in on that and say, hey, what do you mean about this problem? Or don't you think this is a bigger thing than this? And you'll work with them to change things on the roadmap and to work with them. So it's a communication document. It's like writing a brief for somebody. And therefore, you can add as much or as little to the cards as is necessary, as is appropriate for the stakeholder who's going to be looking at it. So we have been here for almost. An <laughs> Thanks, Jenna. I was just saying uh, we have been here for almost an hour, um, and I know some of you guys have to go, but there is one last question I'm going to take. Um, because it is really interesting. Um, Matt said, how would you encourage people to see um, the Lean Roadmap as an adaptable guideline? Ooh, how do we encourage people to uh, see it as an adaptable? Um, a few things that I see people do, and I'm, I'm going to assume that you're talking about how you bring this into your company and convince the people around you um, rather than how we convince people. Um, we convince people by talking them through you know, how we've seen it work within other companies like this. Um, and how I've seen it work within other companies is, um, step one, it's often easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. The only reason people do that old school roadmap format is, I think, because if you Google product roadmap and you look at the image search results, even today you get a whole bunch of Gantt charts, a whole bunch of timeline roadmaps. And I don't blame product managers for assuming that this is this is the output that are expected. This is what product people do. Uh, I know this is true because this is how I started off road mapping. I googled what's a roadmap and started following up formats and started building my own. It was only years later that I realized how much it was failing me and that actually it wasn't needed. And what I've actually found is that we have now seen thousands of product managers move away from timelines and onto this more lean format. And oftentimes, their bosses don't care. Their teams don't care. In fact, they're happy that they have a now clear outline of the problems they're solving, the objections that are going to be tackled along the way, um, the objectives that are going to be um, solved or that are going to the metrics that are going to move, um, and uh, clarity on what kind of things are happening in the near term. Um, and so oftentimes you find that you can actually switch it out and your bosses don't say, hey, but what about, you know, 
what's going to happen in December 2019 launch. Reality is, is that if somebody starts picking on it and saying, hey, I want to see that timeline, what's going to happen here? You can usually retort and say, well, you don't know how big the team's going to be. Are we going to hire the next five developers by July? Are we going to get that funding landing in April? Um, if they can't answer that, then you certainly can't give you know, a detailed resource plan of exactly what's going to be built by when and whom, uh, let alone, um, you know, think that it's logical to try to lock down your entire year's plan at the beginning of the year and work to it um, like uh, uh, completely blindly. So oftentimes you can actually get people to switch without necessarily having to do the, um, uh, to do a massive, you know, uh, convince the boss campaign. Uh, other companies do have more trouble with this, and I think one of the biggest pushbacks that we get is that some things do have dates, some things are date-driven, and the reality is is that some things will be date-driven, and so we're not saying get rid of dates, we're just saying minimize them, think about them before you put them on the roadmap, think about whether it's strategically important and whether it's externally driven, or whether you're just putting them on there to appease the roadmap gods, whether you're there to just, you know, doing it to appease the bosses. Um, and so oftentimes uh, you can remove half the dates on your roadmap by moving away from that timeline with the dates along the top and just have your different cards in there. And that way you're still able to say, these are the big problems we think we're going to tackle. This is the order we're going to tackle them in. Oh, and by the way, these ones are all annotated with milestones or dates. You can still see that. I haven't taken that away. In fact, I've just given you more clarity on the bigger picture of what we're going to do. I think with that, um, it has been an hour. So thank you guys so much for sticking around and asking your questions and being so engaged. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can pop them over at hello at propat.com or uh, through Twitter. We love tweets, so we're just at propat um, or on Facebook or on, you know, choose your medium. We're everywhere, quite literally. Uh, we don't sleep. Uh, but that is it for us. Uh, that's also Jana's uh, contact details if you want to contact her directly. Uh, we have also posted uh, the roadmap clinics on the questions tab. If you guys want to check that out, it's propat.com. There we go. <laughs> or you can just use that link, uh, which Jana just uh, uh, put up on the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. So well prepared. I love it. Um, that is it for us. Uh, have a, I was going to say have a wonderful weekend, but it's only Tuesday. So have a wonderful rest of the week. Wonderful. Thanks so very much, everybody. Thank you, Andrea. And Merry Christmas to everybody. Uh, see you guys in the new year.